It is my pleasure to welcome you here on behalf of the event organizers, the, Marty Center, the Martin Marty Center for Public Understanding of Religion at the Divinity School, the Lumen Christi Institute, the Institute of Politics, and the International House Global Voices Program. We are honored to have as our special guest, New York Times op-ed columnist, Ross Douthat. Joining him for a panel discussion on religion and religious expression in the academy and public life will be Jeffrey Stone, Edward H. Levy, Distinguished Pro Service Professor at the Law School, Lori Zoloth, Margaret E. Burton, Professor and Dean of the Divinity School, William Schweiker, Edward L. Ryerson, Distinguished Service Professor of Theological Ethics in the Divinity School, and William Kavanaugh, Professor of Catholic Studies and Director for the Center of World Catholicism at DePaul University. I now welcome to the podium our moderator for this afternoon's discussion, Wilhelmine Otten, who is Professor of Theology and the History of Christianity and Director of the Martin Marty Center at the Divinity School. Please join me in welcoming Wilhelmine and all of our panelists to the stage. Thank you and um, welcome for this afternoon's event, which has been introduced a number of times now. So the only introduction that I have to do is about the procedure of the debate this afternoon on religion and religious expression in the academy and public life. We want to proceed as follows. Um, Ross Douthat is first gonna give um, his remarks from the podium, and he'll be followed by Jeff Stone and Laurie Zolot in order. Um, after that, he gets to um, respond, and we'll have a little bit of a debate. And then in a second round, um, Professor Bill Schweikers and Bill Kavanaugh will give their remarks also from the podium, after which Ross again gets to respond and we'll have some more discussion and hopefully get to the audience um, discussion also. So the only job left for me is to introduce Ross Douthat, who will now take the podium and give his remarks as New York Times columnist, before that um, senior editor at The Atlantic, the youngest New York Times columnist um, in the paper's history, appointed in April 2009, and his column appears on Wednesdays and Sunday. Actually, there was one today, um, if I remember correctly. And he is a nationally recognized commentator voice on many topics, um, but religion and politics seems to be a favored intersection of, of his interest. So please join me in welcoming Ross Douthat to the podium. Thank you so much. <laughs> Apologies, my microphone is slipping. Um, thank you so much for that kind introduction. Uh, can everyone hear me? Are the acoustics acceptable? Great. Um, thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, I'm very grateful to the Lumen Christi Institute, to the Martin Marty Center, to the Divinity School, to the University of Chicago, and to the people of Chicago um, for welcoming me and organizing this event, which uh, promises to be hopefully as educational for me as it is for all of you. Um, I've been asked to introduce things and sort of kick things off by talking a little bit about the topic, um, which is religion and religious expression in the academy. And I thought one useful way to get into that would be to talk about some ways in which modern academic life reflects religious expression that isn't always described as religious expression. Um, and that reflects in certain ways a kind of return of the repressed, a return of the religious identity that most American colleges and universities, including this one, had at their inception and have gradually forfeited, closed off, or put away over the last 100, 150 to 200 years. Um, so I think it's useful and reasonable to think of the story of American higher education as a story of um, the gradual triumph of technocracy over both humanism and confessional religious identity, uh, that we have sort of gradually moved in a university system from an initial commitment to confessional principles, um, Protestant especially, but Catholic as well, 
towards a focus on a kind of post-religious humanism towards the present day model in which the modern university is seen as existing to serve as a kind of engine of the commonwealth, an engine of economic growth, of scientific research, of technological progress, and a means of educating the managerial class that oversees this entire national ecosystem and imperial political order. Um, and that has been a long process with many fits and starts. It's played out differently for older universities than newer ones, different for Catholic, differently for Catholic universities than for Protestant ones. But I think you see this trend sort of consistently and persistently in universities across the country. Um, and as that has happened, the metaphysical and moral horizons of many universities have naturally been lowered. And there's been much more of a focus on sort of a kind of mass production of elites. Uh, the production, again, as I said, of kind of managers for a system for whom a religious education isn't necessary and a humanistic education is a nice luxury good, but non-essential. And what is ultimately important is a kind of scientific economistic and technical education. And that, I think, certainly is, describes the university system as I found it when I entered it in the late 1990s, which of course was a kind of peak of sort of technocratic optimism, a sense that you know we really were at the end of history and Alan Greenspan had solved all of our economic problems and neoliberalism had solved all of our political problems and um, really you could just sort of proceed with life, become a management consultant and live happily ever after. Or at least that was what the orientation <laughs> promised me in 1998 or so. Uh, and that, that mentality, I think, remains, in many respects, the dominant worldview of most institutions, with some variation. And I think uni the University of Chicago, with its sort of specific curricular commitments, is an interesting exception to some of these rules. But in general, I think that's the dominant spirit of the modern university. And it's a spirit, in turn, that I think produces um, different kinds of effectively religious reactions uh, within, within the university um, from faculty in certain respects, but particularly from students and student life and student culture, um, most of which go under the umbrella of left-wing political activism, left-wing political protest, and so are not necessarily seen in religious terms, but I think often reflect kind of religious energies that don't want to describe themselves as such. Um, I, I think in academic life, the kind, of, the kind of sort of return of the repressed phenomenon I'm talking about is sort of chronically manifested in the crisis of the humanities, which is something that people in the humanities have been talking about for as long as I've been alive and some decades certainly before that, uh, but which reflects, I think, an uncertainty about the place of humanistic activity under this kind of technocratic paradigm. I think for a time there was an assumption that humanism could sort of survive without, could survive without religious grounding and could ultimately replace the religious confessionalism that it, that it, that it had displaced, that it could sort of, that a kind of religion of humanity, a religion of art, a religion of, of um, sort of religion of genius and literary excellence and musical greatness and all of the rest could sort of fill the moral and metaphysical void at the center of the university that Protestant and Catholic confessionalism had once filled. And I think over the last, we could say, 100 years or 50 years, pick any period you want, I think it would be true, over, over, the, last, over the last century, um, this has proven to be extremely difficult. And in fact, without, um, without its sort of prior half uneasy alliance with religion, humanism has found itself persistently retreating, persistently sort of crowded out of importance within the university by sort of technocratic, technological science and scientific pursuits, and perpetually uncertain about whether it should justify itself in those terms, whether it should justify itself in terms of, you know, we in the English department do research just as people in the chemistry department do research, and we can sort of reach sort of 
almost technological conclusions about our work just as they can reach those conclusions, this kind of sort of scientific envy that per pervades certain humanistic exercises, or whether it should sort of seek refuge, as I think, again, student movements have tended to do in political horizons and saying, uh, you know, humanism can justify its place in the university by placing itself in the service of political causes in the pursuit of the common good, in pursuit of the kind of moral vision that again was once associated with religion in the university. So that's, that's what I think is happening with religious energies within the faculty, that you have this kind of yearning for metaphysical and moral horizons and a yearning for metaphysical and moral authority within the humanities, that there's a sense within the humanities that, there should, that they should have this sort of authoritative role um, but it's hard to figure out how you would wield it, again, without the commitments of religion on the one hand and while under pressure from the technocratic paradigm on the other. And then among students, you have this sort of wave of what I think are reasonable to describe as sort of campus awakenings, um, sort of po political equivalents um, sometimes shot through with explicit religious energy, but off, often shot through only with implicit religious energy, campus equivalents of the series of revivals and awakenings that sort of seemed to rise and fall in American life in the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, so if you look at the trajectory of the last 50 years in university life, you have a kind of wave function where you have a crest of campus protest and campus moralism in the 1960s that sort of subsides across the 70s and 80s, rises again in the curricular conflicts and sort of political correctness debates of the 80s and 90s, subsides again across the 90s and into the 2000s, again, the period when I was in college, and over the last five or 10 years has risen again. And the very, the, the language in which I think especially contemporary campus protest and sort of activism and left-wing politics is couched is the language of a sort of Calvinism, Calvinism without God or a, a sort of Catholic, it's, it has both Calvinist and Catholic elements. It has the Catholic element of sort of self-scrutiny, entering the confessional, confessing your sins, confessing your privilege, confessing all of the different ways that your, that your upbringing and so on has, has left you, um, has left you compromised by what isn't called sin, what's called you know, privilege, hierarchy, hegemony, and so on, but which serves the same personal function that Catholic or Calvinist morality would have played. So you have that confessional element, you have the obsessive self-scrutinizing, you have the idea that certain groups are effectively elect, that certain victim groups represent a kind of Christ-like victim figure who's, who, who campus activism is supposed to elevate, and other groups by their nature, by sort of being part of hegemonic forces of patriarchy and whiteness and maleness and so on, are, uh, you know, are, are, are in, again, in sort of Calvinist terms, not part of the elect, are in fact sort of presumed, <laughs> presumed to be um, damned and liable to judgment. Um, you have that kind of dynamic and you have the kind of florid emotionalism uh, that characterizes religious awakenings. This, you know, the sort of confrontations that get captured on video sometimes of students with faculty and students who are offended by different things and students who want to retreat into sanctuaries of various kinds, who want the university to provide a kind of moral community from which outsiders are excluded, which is, again, characteristic of religious traditions. Um, I could sort of ramble on, but I think it, it comes in certain ways to, to the sharpest point in debates over campus sexual morality, where the technocratic paradigm essentially emptied out sexual morality. It, you know, it presents, it, it treats students as perfectly atomized individuals who will be supplied with condoms and birth control pills and told to sort of forge, forge sort of contractarian relationships, consent-based relationships with one another, and everything is supposed to work out perfectly well. And of course, in a campus environment filled with hormones and alcohol and misbehavior and stupidity, it doesn't work out well. And so you have this desperate attempt to remoralize sexual life, not in Judeo-Christian terms, uh, in, in theoretically in certain ways in more permissive terms, <laughs> because there's, 
you know, you're, you're not having sort of a, a return to an emphasis on chastity per se, but you have an intense scrutiny of sort of every moment of sexual decision and the idea that, you know, you have these incredibly strict rules for when a man is supposed to pursue and when he's not and what means yes and what means no and so on. You have a kind of potentially minute regulation of sexual life that then the university itself, which has been trying, and certainly when I was in college, was desperately trying to absent itself from sexual life, has been pulled back in by students as a kind of direct adjudicator of these moral sexual disputes. Again, not always with happy consequences for the students involved, but the point that I'm trying to stress is you have a kind of, it, it, it has been criticized and but I don't think you, you need to use the term critically. You can just say descriptively that there is a neo-Puritanism being sought by many campus social activists around sex and rape and sexual violence that is an attempt, again, to sort of re-import into campus life the kind of moral codes that would have been associated with the Baptist founders of the University of Chicago or the Methodist founders of Northwestern. Um, uh, or the founders of my own alma mater, which used to have its motto, Veritas Pro Christe et Ecclesia, but we dropped the Christe et Ecclesia a long time ago. So that's sort of my story of how in these secularized post-confessional universities, religious aspirations, moral and metaphysical, manifest themselves and sort of religious and post-religious anxieties percolate in academic and intellectual life. Um, and you know, I'm a political conservative, and therefore I'm always acutely aware that sort of the surges of activism that wash over campus, if they had their way, would probably take my certain ideas, at least, that I care about and believe in and hold dear and sort of exclude them from debate, um, would declare certain things that I say unsafe for students and so on. And so in certain ways, on an issue-by-issue -issue basis, I'm a natural critic and skeptic of some of these movements I'm describing. Um, but at the same time, I can't be a full critic and a full skeptic because I think the activist critique of the modern university, of the kind of moral vacuum that exists when religion is stripped away, humanism weakens, and technocracy takes its place, that critique is absolutely correct. And it's a critique that I felt in my bones when I spent four years in elite higher education. And so when I look at sort of these sort of halting, fumbling, sometimes hysterical, sometimes ridiculous, sometimes intolerant attempts to re-import sort of moral and metaphysical visions into academic life, I may be sort of horrified by some of the specifics, but I'm very sympathetic to the spirit um, because I, I think that ultimately you can't have institutions that are supposed to be dedicated to the pursuit of truth and the education of the young that lack sort of moral convictions and metaphysical horizons. I think it works very badly. It produces versions of what my colleague David Brooks once called the organization kid um, and what William, I never know how to pronounce his last name, um, Derisowicz, how's that? Is anybody? Yeah, yeah. I have the same problem with my own last name, so hopefully he won't take offense. <laughs> but he described as excellent sheep, that the sort of the product, the product of the meritocratic factory are human beings with low horizons, um, weak morals, and a lot of technical mastery. Um, and those kind of people are not actually the kind of people that a great university and a thriving culture should seek to be producing. So. I don't want the campus left to rule the modern university, um, but I think that it is speaking to a kind of sort of sustained and systemic problem that has been building in the university since it secularized, since its confessional commitments went away, and that um, ought to be addressed. And I've rambled on a bit, and this, you know, this would be the point where I would you know, naturally sort of provide a three-point plan to address this problem. Unfortunately, I don't have a three-point plan to address this problem because the, the central tension that the university faces in confronting this issue is that the university, the, the universities like this one, universities like the Ivy League, any, any major public university, they're trying to be universities that educate people to lead American society writ large. They're not trying to just be universities for a particular religious tradition, a particular ethnic group, and so on. And that's an admirable, an admirable approach to take. The problem is that our society does not have a serious 
intellectually substantial religious center. It did to, certain, to a certain extent 50 or 60 or 70 years ago. You could say 50 or 60 or 70 years ago that the convergence of the Protestant mainline and a somewhat liberalized Catholic church provided a kind of religious center for American life. That is gone. The Protestant mainline is mostly dying. Roman Catholicism is divided by a kind of constant civil war. Evangelical Protestantism has sort of tried to fill the center and sort of hit a ceiling and failed to sort of escape some of its internal tensions and contradictions. And so the essential religious center of American life today is Oprah Winfrey and Eat, Pray, Love and Joel Osteen. And it's very hard to imagine building a sort of, you know, building a moral and metaphysical foundation for universities that serve that culture on the basis of that sort of soft, squishy, highly individualistic, somewhat anti-intellectual center. So the university just has a problem. It's sort of made its, it's made it, it's made itself. There's a barrenness at the center of the university where religion and humanism used to be. But it's hard to imagine filling that with any particular religious vision that would actually fit American society as it actually exists. So I'm left with a more plaintive and sort of generalized plea um, for university presidents, administrators, faculty, students, and so on to simply try and take religion more seriously than they do right now. And to recognize that the problem with displacing religious energy into politics while it can be healthy in certain ways, polit political visions and religious energy go hand in hand and work together in certain ways, it also can lead to a kind of sort of perpetually apocalyptic mentality in which ordinary political disputes are invested with constant, with sort of near religious significance. And the university, if the university is sort of fully remoralized purely by the campus left, then it will become ever more alienated from a huge swath of American society upon which it depends for funding and political support. And that's part of what you see in the Trump era, I think, that you have this growing and dangerous division between sort of right of center America and not so much private universities necessarily like Chicago, but public universities and the entire complex that should work together and be connected. So it's not sufficient for universities to sort of have this kind of balancing act that they're trying to do right now where they sort of are run like technocracies but sort of draw some moralism from the campus left and try and make it all fit together. They need a more capacious vision. They need a more a vision that better represents society as a whole. I don't know exactly what that vision should be, but I know that it starts with taking religious ideas more seriously than I think the academy does at just about every level of the modern university. So I can get into more specifics for building a Catholic theocracy in the you know, <laughs> question and answer session, but I hope that's a useful way to start things off. And again, I'm very grateful to all of you for coming. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ross. That was very challenging. Um, my take on this uh, is very much shaped by my own commitment to the principle of academic freedom, uh, which is at the very core of our university and of American higher education generally, and which is, in my view, largely incompatible with what you just heard. Although I know that Ross is not calling for a return to a world in which religious doctrine dominated higher education, it is, I think, important to recall what that world once looked like. Um, as far back as the Middle Ages, there existed a hard core of authoritatively established doctrine, which was made obligatory on all scholars and teachers. In that world, each new accretion of knowledge had to be consistent with a single system of truth anchored in Christian dogma. For the next several centuries, university life remained largely bounded by religious doctrine, and real freedom of thought was neither practiced nor professed. In American colleges, freedom of inquiry was severely limited by the constraints of religious doctrine. Harvard's president, for example, was forced to resign because he denied the scriptural validity of infant baptism. The latter part of the 18th century did see a brief period of secularization of American colleges as part of the Enlightenment. But that shift was short-lived, 
for the opening decades of the 19th century brought a sharp retrogression. This was due largely to the rise of religious evangelicals during the Second Great Awakening, which led to a sharp counterattack against the skepticism of the Enlightenment and to a concerted effort on the part of Protestant churches to reassert their control over intellectual life. As a result of this development, the American college in the first half of the 19th century once again found itself deeply centered in religion. It looked to antiquity for the tools of thought and to Christianity for the laws of living. This focus stymied free discussion and squelched any creativity. Freedom of inquiry and teaching were smothered in this era by the prevailing theory of doctrinal moralism, which assumed that the worth of any idea must be judged by its moral worth as determined by the college's leaders, an attitude that is anathema to scholarly inquiry. Now, between 1870 and 1900, there was a genuine revolution in American higher education. Dramatic reforms, such as graduate instruction and scientific courses, were implemented, and new academic goals were embraced. To criticize, as well as to preserve traditional understandings of religious principles, became an accepted function of higher education. Much of this transformation was due to the dispute over Darwin's theory of evolution. Religious opponents of Darwin's theory attempted to silence and to exclude proponents of Darwinism whenever possible. The disputes were often quite bitter, and in these conflicts, science and education joined forces to attack both the principle of doctrinal moralism and the authority of the clergy. A new approach to education and to intellectual discourse grew out of the Darwinian debate. To the evolutionists, all beliefs were tentative and verifiable only through a continuous process of inquiry. The evolutionists held that every claim to truth must submit to open verification, that the process of verification must follow certain rules, and that this process is best understood by those who qualify as experts. By the end of the century, William Rainey Harper, the first president of the University of Chicago, could boldly proclaim that, quote, when for any reason the administration of a university attempts to dislodge a professor or punish a student because of his political or religious sentiments, at that moment, the institution has ceased to be a university. Now, it was in this spirit that half a century ago, the University of Chicago made clear in the Calvin Report that, and I quote, the mission of university is the discovery, improvement, and dissemination of knowledge. To perform its mission, a university must sustain an extraordinary environment of freedom of inquiry and must encourage the widest diversity of views. So what I want to emphasize then is that it, that it is wholly inappropriate for a university, a real university, to insist that any particular set of moral or religious beliefs are right and must therefore be embraced by members of the community. Although I know that Ross is not advocating a return to the early 19th century, I do want to make clear why universities are and should be extremely cautious about getting into the business of deciding that there are right moral or religious values that should be inculcated in students as part of the curriculum. And I have to say, I am especially uneasy about this at the present time, because we live in an era in which religion and politics have come together in a manner that is in many ways reminiscent of the Second Great Awakening. The risk that government officials in this era at either the state or the federal level will link government funding to higher education to compliance with requirements that are designed to shape both research and teaching, including in matters relating to religion and morality, is now more serious than it has been at any time in living memory. And this poses a serious threat to higher education. Now, having said all this, I don't disagree with Ross that it might be constructive for institutions of higher learning to expand their educational focus on critical thinking about moral issues. Such issues are important to the individual and to our society, and students can surely learn a lot from rigorous debate and discussion of such questions. In fact, I suspect we here at the University of Chicago do a lot more of this than most other institutions, particularly in various aspects of our core curriculum. Now, thinking about this from my own experience, um, I can see why this can sometimes be tricky. As a professor of constitutional law, I often teach about topics that raise strong moral and religious perspectives. These include such issues as abortion, racial injustice, sexual expression, affirmative action, the death penalty, the rights of gays and lesbians, hate speech, the rights of immigrants, and assisted suicide, to name just a few. 
What's tricky for me about bringing moral and religious perspectives into being and into discussion, as distinct from legal perspectives, is that debate about these questions in the classroom creates great awkwardness and conflict among students with different religious views, views that I don't think I should be moderating. Although a rigorous debate about legal issues on these subjects is essential and indeed is always lively and engaging, getting into the moral and religious questions is frankly for me much more complex and daunting. Do I really want to get into a debate in class, for example, of whether Catholic doctrine is morally right on the issue of abortion, or whether evangelical Christians are morally right to condemn sodomy? It's a lot easier and more appropriate for me to ask whether religious doctrine should play a role in legitimating secular law than it is to debate the merits of a particular student's faith. Now, perhaps that's a more comfortable exercise for faculty in the Divinity School. <laughs> Be that as it may, I rather doubt that the specific challenges that Roth identifies with respect to such issues as sexual assault and, controver and controversial speakers on campus really have all that much to do with metaphysical discussions of morality. It's perfectly appropriate, in my view, for university officials to discuss these matters with students in terms of broader questions of civility and mutual respect, matters that go to the very core of creating an appropriate institutional culture at a university. In truth, though I don't think the issues that arise in these contexts derive from any overall lack of morality on the part of our students, but rather to a failure on their part, sometimes to think as clearly as they should about the meaning and consequences of their actions in these specific settings. And although there are legitimate curricular components to such questions, for example, I'm now teaching a course in the college uh, on freedom of expression, uh, which was triggered very much by the kind of issues that have arisen in universities about uh, free speech on campus. Uh, my guess is that most of the work that has to be done in these areas with students has less to do with religious precepts, legal jurisprudence, or moral philosophy than with common sense and with gaining a deeper understanding of the other perspective and the other side. So in my view, there are real challenges here, but they aren't due to an absence of religious or moral theory in the classroom. In the end, this comes down, I think, to inspiring our students to approach such questions in the way that our nation's founders, including men like Franklin, Jefferson, and Adams, described when they saw what they saw as the core principle of all of the world's great religions, to do to others as you would that others would do to you. That seems to be the most central principle that is important for us to get across to our students. Thank you. Well, I come from the Divinity School where we take religion very seriously. It's the whole show, right? So first of all, thank you for the opportunity to speak together today, to meet a thinker that I find, despite my SDS background, intriguing, smart, and provocative. I'm going to say now to you what many university professors must say to him. My background was in the 1960s, and my politics then and now lean very much to the left. But frankly, Rastorat is so right in many of his instincts that many times he just convinces me. I'm especially happy that he also dislikes the movie Eat, Pray, Love, whatever, um, which I really dislike enormously. And I thank him for his wit and his insight tonight. I thought the Calvinist thing was brilliant. Um, thank you as well to, to um, Thomas Levergood and Lumen Christie, to my colleague Wilhelmine Otten, the great director of the great Marty Center at the Divinity School, where we take religion very seriously. And of course, my terrific University of Chicago colleagues, the International House and IOP. It is a pleasure to think carefully about the nature, goal, and meaning of our university, this great, tumultuous place. It is a good and rare thing also to speak seriously about our great duty of citizenship, which is in part what Mr. Duat is considering when he notes that one important goal of a university is to awaken in students the capacity of carrying on critical classical liberal traditions. The university is one of the few institutions that have remained intact for 900 years, along, of course, and only, with the church, and in my case, with the long practices of Jews pouring over scripture and the Talmud. And of course, this long history begins not with our American practice, or even with the Enlightenment, frankly, but with Roger Bacon, empiricists, and medieval practices, all of which, of course, created the arguments that the study of the world, the discovery, and the measurement, and the math, and logic were valuable as testimony to God. It is Mr. Duart's concern, as I understand it, that this tradition, 
rich in detail, ritual, and truthful content, has been long lost to us, scooped out and hollowed, replaced by technocracy and an affection for the personal quest, a popular theology, that's Joel Osteen, with a self at the center. And what we need to try to establish is a metaphysical and a moral horizon that could possibly be held in common, even though, yes, it's a difficult time. So universities are in crisis, but is a crisis they deserve, he has argued, for they have become places in which students will feel isolated in their search for sources of character and for meaning, and where students in the search for order then paradoxically erect ever more rigid structures of constraints around such things as speech or sex. Now, Mr. Duat is a Catholic and a sincere one, and he is largely concerned with tasks of Christians or Americans as Christians, and I think that's an important task, but I'm a Jew, and it can sort of make me feel like a, like a bystander. Um, but what he says about our shared life in the academy, the phenomenon on which he reflects, is shared by scholars who are believers across the spectrum of the university. Now, after I just wrote that, I'm a believer, I have to confess to a moment of tension, outing myself as an Orthodox Jew. But then there you have it. It is in the Talmud one is trained to ask, perhaps the opposite is equally the case. Dort is arguing that without these fundamental premises, American universities were, after all, originally set up to train clergy, including this one, clergy and high school teachers. We lack the capacity to adequately discern or to judge or finally to ever create policy in a real political life in the Orentian sense. Universities are places where scholarly truth claims have always been contested. And it is in large part this very contention, not actually doctrinal authority, this creation of arguments, this placing of word on word, our sociability of discourse, the question, can I convince you of the logic? Can I come to believe if I'm wrong? Why, I argue, it is imperative that the arguments of the texts and the traditions of faith communities be heard in the public square and in the university is for two reasons. First, because our arguments are like every other argument. For everyone chooses first premises, and everyone stands in front of canonical texts, the Quran or the New Testament, or in Jeff's case, the US Constitution, which, by the way, was written by Dias. And second, because arguments that emerge from the texts and traditions of the faith communities are not like every other argument. In our time, when the idea that ontological success is linked to money and power, when worth is so linked to a narrow field of humans, it is only the texts of religious communities that create a place where sacrifice is demanded, where the poor are taken into your home, where it is sensible to give enormously to your neighbor, where duty is more important than pleasure, where society could be judged by how it treats the most vulnerable among us. It is in these traditions where mastery is questioned and where we're moved to ask, what are the limits of our power? In a time where science is so compelling and so beautiful and happens so quickly, one can ask the empirical question there to be sure, how do we know what's true? But there is no inherent capacity to ask, what is the right act and what makes it so? And this is the task only of the arguments of a moral order. Questions not of religious insensibility or fanaticism or doctrinal authority, but questions that emerge only from the long debates about what we owe to one another. And that's why I agree when he tells us that as scholars we need quote, a more frank acknowledgement of the inescapability of religious questions in both intellectual work and in the social order of undergraduate life. Now, I'm an optimist, and one of the things I'm really most optimistic about is the capacity for the endurance of the great universities. I really don't think we're in such a crisis. We really don't deserve to be in a crisis. But perhaps being in a crisis just is a simply the state of the institution itself. It was a big crisis throughout the medieval period. People disagreed, and they killed each other. And as <laughs> Professor Otten would tell us, and it was in crisis during all of early modernity. And it was in crisis with Darwin, to be sure. And those who, of us who lived through the 1960s on campus, a lot of fun, but we were certain we were going to change everything. And my horrified professors surely thought we were in crisis. Yet here we all are, still debating, still deciding, still trying to think about how we know and what we know to be true. And so my most optimistic thought is that we've invited Mr. Duhart tonight, and that's proof enough for me that how we live and work in an extraordinary place, these places that actually define not only who we are, 
but what we strive to be. Um, both professors Stone and Zolot for wonderfully um, um, lucid comments and, and Mr. Douthat first. I would like to give you the chance to respond now briefly before we exchange some more views. Okay, I will very quickly <laughs> express agreement with the dean and argue <laughs> briefly with the professor. <laughs> um, I, I, think, I, I think the point on which you, you ended is an incredibly useful one, not just for this debate, but for any debate we... we were to engage in. Yes, the feeling of crisis is a sort of permanent feature of human existence on this earth. And there's never a moment where, you know, whether in humanities departments or science departments or, you know, colleges training priests in 17th century New England, everybody sat around and said, ah, our university is going great. We've, we've you know, in, in the 17th century, they were all convinced it was the end of the world and they were training, training preachers for the last judgment that would probably involve the papal antichrist. So, you know, you, 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 have, to, you have to carry in all of these discussions and this, I think, applies generally to our political moment as well, a certain realism about sort of how these things cycle and return and, uh, yeah, the fact that sort of we live provisionally and we're always going to be in an argument and there's never mm -hmm. going to be a, a perfect moment. I, I will say just as a sort of caveat, I mean, th there are particular issues, one of which you mentioned about this moment, that are distinctive. Mm -hmm. I think the alienation between the uni sort of university culture and a big swath of conservative-leaning America is distinctive and has been yeah. accelerated mm -hmm. by the intersection, if you will, of campus activism and the ascent of Donald Trump. I think both of those have sort of fed into this divide that is, you know, not, again, not a new thing, mm -hmm. but it's, it's reaching a distinctive point. And the sort of, and related to that, uh, you know, my, my colleague Paul Krugman has written about this and sort of cheered it on, but you know, and I, I've, I'm, more, I'm more critical, but whether you sort of think it's right and good or not, university faculty, especially in my region of the country, the Northeast, have grown more politically homogenous over the last 25 years than they were 25 years ago. That's a new and distinctive thing. Um, so th that's sort of, mm -hmm. to the extent that, you know, there's always a crisis, but we can identify certain distinctive things about this moment and think about it. Um, and then in the sort of always true vein, uh, see, I guess I, I do think, I think religious and moral questions are inescapable in a way that you yourself and your argument sort of reflect implicitly. Um, you know, you, you can sort of try and reduce them. You can say, well, we can reduce theological debate to a first principle, like love your neighbor as yourself. We can reduce moral debate to a first principle. You know, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created, evolved, something equal, right? right? You, can, you can reduce, and I think the tendency in secular liberalism especially is to sort of hopefully reduce in the sense if we get it small enough, we won't need that, all that metaphysical baggage that the Catholics and Protestants and Jews and Mormons and Muslims and Buddhists are always nattering on about. Uh, the but, the pro but the problem is that then as soon as you get back to sort of ordinary human interaction, the problem expands again. And I, I don't see the divide that you identify between sort of morality and metaphysics on the one hand and sort of the common sense that you think should guide men through sexual, drunken sexual encounters with women. I think those <laughs> encounters pre present moral dilemmas and those moral dilemmas will be affected by what you think a human being is. I mean, not in the moment itself, necessarily. You're not gonna be, you know, reaching, reaching, for, reaching for Aristotle at that, you know, man is a political animal, therefore I shouldn't, you know, take off her blouse. I don't know, but, um, but, but nonetheless, those, those deeper questions are, are there. And the tendency, again, I think what you're seeing on campus is a revolt against, in part, reductionism, against the idea that, well, we're all just sort of, sexual beings who should act on our desires and it'll all work out. There's a desire to go up a level, even if what right now you find up a level seems more sort of bureaucratic than necessarily, necessarily religious. And so I, I mean, I, I think that universities, you know, it's, it's true that we don't, you know, make rules um, based on 
the dogmas of you know, the Congregationalist Church or the Catholic Church in terms of what scholars look at, but scholars in universities today are bound by a different set of moral commitments, which you yourself gestured to in your list. You know, you, when you were listing things you could talk about in the classroom, you said racial injustice. You assume the injustice of racism. You don't have scholars in major universities working on sort of theories of race hierarchy. And yes, you can argue, well, that's just empiricism working itself out. But there's, an in, there's, a, moral, there's a moral claim there that is not ultimately provable one way or another. You, you do have to fall back in certain ways to moral, moral and metaphysical principles. And the same, I think, you know, out of the nine or 10 things you listed, at least three of them you freighted with moralistic language because you can't help but do it. Um, so I, I think that, yeah, I, I think that the modern university relies on a mix of technocracy and a sort of this kind of post-Calvinist sort of social justice spirit for it provides the moral ballast and the two are in tension and they, you know, and they both are limited in certain ways and with some of the broader horizons that religious traditions could provide could get closer to the truth about human existence, which is, as you so admirably said, what the university is all about. And to end on a note, uh, maybe not of agreement, but at least picking up on a point you made, I think your reaction to the way students are in class, you know, your, your, your feeling that if we debate this legally, it's easier than if we debate it morally, and if we debate it morally, then it's easier than if we debate it religiously. That's a phenomenon that I well recognize from my, my own conversations in my entire life, but it maybe reflects there a failure on the part of religion to sort of teach people that, you know, if you have religious ideas, they're not, you know, as you, they're not different in kind. They're not something that's held, you, you have your, you know, your Catholicism that you carry into campus life and hold over here, and you'll have legal arguments over here, but, you know, you're holding your faith for fideistic reasons and so on. No, any, any faith that informs your moral perspective, that informs your legal perspective, has to be itself reasonably defensible. And I think it can be both the case that the secular university should be more accommodating and understanding and encouraging of students or faculty who want to bring their religious perspectives into debate and that religious traditions themselves that are raising these kids who come into your classroom and get all like this when you raise an issue should be building people who are like this, who are saying, hi, I'm a Muslim and I'd like to, you know, I'd like to defend the hijab and I don't feel uncomfortable doing that, even though, you know, if you're the Muslim defending the hijab in a classroom of University of Chicago students, I imagine you would be starkly outnumbered. So uh, um, on that note of at least possible common ground, mm -hmm. I, I, will, I will close. Well, um, uh, thank you all very much. Let me just come to the defense of Professor Stone a little bit, um, <laughs> coming from the Divinity School. So um, when President Zimmer gives our students their degrees, he welcomes them to the community of scholars. And in listening to all of your comments, um, I feel that, and, and over time actually, I feel that that has become a somewhat empty term. And, and, and some of what you're um, uh, signaling, uh, Mr. Delta, uh, speaks to that, campus life, et cetera. Because it's a very thin notion of community. Yes, you've all gone through the same hoops and now you all have your degree. But what does the sense of community mean? And I think um, the way universities have evolved over time, you said they're, they're far apart from the majority of America. It's true, I taught an institution on the East Coast where the local Irish community would send their kids to go to college, but now they can't afford to send their kids to go to college there. So it's, it's prohibitive, the, the cost of college education. And so they've become separated from regular society, if you will. And I think on the other hand, initiatives like you have at the University of Chicago, but I'm sure elsewhere, like we have a Logan Center, we're going to get a university, a, a, a museum. There is a sense that the university needs to flesh out that notion of what community is to include some sort of life, not just jumping through the hoops. And I'm wondering if it isn't that that we're struggling with, what kind of community we are, and that you're saying that religion should be a part of that. Um, but Professor Stone is more skeptical. And, and the one thing I think you didn't mention, I've been thinking about, universities have very often, and not unreasonably so, compare, been compared to monasteries because there's a sort of ascetic discipline, right? 
And as a woman, I applaud secularization because it made it easier for me to enter that monastery. And I don't want to let go of that emancipatory value that you have at the university. So religion as part of life, community life, yes, mm -hmm. but not, you know, not, not imposing it and not going back to that ivory tower monastic sort of ethos. Uh, well, yes, but <laughs> Good. the difficulty is, and, and so, I mean, look, I, I completely understand mm -hmm. the historical anxiety that undergirds resistance to the idea of sort of placing any kind of religious commitment at the center of the university. Um, and I am, you know, I, I like to imagine that there exists a balance between sort of moral and metaphysical commitments and the kind of um, sort of modern openness that you mm -hmm. appreciate as a woman and the kind of general sort of skeptical pursuit of knowledge openness that religious authorities have often attempted to constrain. So if I'm drawing up my ideal university in my mind, you know, I think that there are religious institutions now that maybe at least somewhat come close to it that sort of try and maintain a religious identity while also being open to, you know, sort of open to the best of modernity and the best of the scientific spirit and so on. But it's completely the case that there, that there will always be a tension between the purpose of the university as, you know, expand the frontiers of knowledge and a purpose of the university as a place that transmits traditions, mm -hmm. that acts as a kind of moral teacher, and that prepares people not just to be part of the community of scholars, but to be you know, leaders of a nation, mm -hmm. a national okay. community, or a global community. My, I guess my point, again, is that I don't think removing the Baptist church from its role in the University of Chicago has mm -hmm. done away with that tension. Mm -hmm. It has mm -hmm. just removed yeah. it from a tension between mm -hmm. clerical authorities and people pursuing knowledge and the, you know, the, the various authorities of liberal multiculturalism who may be more tolerant, not always mm -hmm. of conservatives, but who may be more tolerant than the Puritan divines who they've replaced, um, but still manifest the same sense of like, well, you know, we have, I mean, if you, go into a, if you go into a modern university and you go through the orientation as a student, the orientation at the modern elite university is a moral indoctrination. The moral indoctrination has, you know, sort of multiculturalism as a value. It doesn't have confessional principles. Maybe it sort of distills morality instead of expanding it. Maybe it's less, you know, less bigoted or chauvinist or sexist and so on. You, you can make various arguments for why it's better, but it still is a moral indoctrination. There is still these moral commitments that then, that then students pick up on and demand you know, demand that the university enact more vigorously, right? The, the, you know, they mm -hmm. say, look, you, ma you make all these protestations about multiculturalism and gender equality and racial equality, but then you just seem to be running stuff for the benefit of your scholars. What gives? Mm -hmm. that, I mean, that's the mm -hmm. tension. And so, again, I'm, I'm just saying you haven't, the old tension that, that you're identifying, mm -hmm. which is real and always a problem, doesn't just go away once you get rid of the Baptists. <laughs> Do you want to react briefly and then we... Well, I just want to make it really clear that I, just like Jeffrey Stone, I am a free speech advocate. I believe in everything you've written. I think it's terrific. I go around proudly talking about it. Um, and it's wonderful because it makes space for the kind of arguments I'd like to make about the poor, mm -hmm. uh, about the theopolitical economy in which the poor is central and not some peripheral problem, right, as in market theory. And I think that's all we're saying here. I, I'm not saying, maybe you're saying that you want a Catholic thing here, but, I, but for me, you know, always a minority in, in religious um, terms, it's, this free speech thing is critical, but it can't be that it excludes, the one thing you can't say is, hmm, yeah, what if the sex is true? You know? mm -hmm. and, and what if you should never lie? Because it was the kind of claims that is only possible to make from the text of religious authority. And, they need to be honored and they need to be respected as plausible truth claims. Just like um, you wouldn't expect any reasonable biologist to think, well, you know, I don't know if I really believe this whole stuff about evolution. I mean, you'd want him to believe in this, the value of their work, that it means something, that it's based on something. And we ask the same of our scholars of religion. 
you know, you can't possibly teach it without having some generosity towards that the story. And and you know, we want our students to feel like that's possible in a modern university. Um, without, it's not a confessional statement. It's a statement about the kinds of arguments that should be allowed if we really care about free speech. And again, I don't disagree with any of that. I mean, my view is that at any argument on any issue is appropriate mm -hmm. and people should feel free and be courageous about making it. Yeah. My point is only that the university should not have positions. Yes. That's the difference. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I, yeah. I, there's no, no right. position mm -hmm. that a student would take that I would say, you can't say that. Well, what, what, no, but do you, but, but, do you, but, but you're bootlegging in, that you're bootlegging in some values. There's no, I mean, maybe not. Stand, right? I mean, what, maybe. I mean, do you think, do you think that, I mean, there, I think there is an, an admirable vision of a kind of ideal, perfect free speech based university in which the university really wouldn't have any commitments, but we're not close to having that. And such a university mm -hmm. would end up employing racists, sexists, right. defenders of fascism, defenders of Stalin, mm -hmm. right. you know. If Such were people good, are employed in If they were good scholars, they should be employed. Right. Mm -hmm. If they were good scholars, however. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And, that, and that is, there, and university, I should say, do, you know, I mean, the tenure system is obviously designed to protect, in some cases, just such people. Um, but they usually don't express those views until they get tenure. So <laughs> uh, I, I, I just think it is, it, there does not exist an actual university that in its public commitments there exist universities that are committed to free speech within within the university, but even even those universities still have commitments to you know generally the liberal democratic order, which is itself a moral and metaphysical vision, which rests ultimately on Judeo-Christian ideas, even if it is, thinks it can do without them. Or as we say, Christo-Jewish ideas. Yeah. Christo-Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. I think at this point we move to the next two um, um, commentators. Um, first, Professor Schweiker and then Professor Kavanaugh. Great. Well, I want to begin by uh, thanking Professor Wilhelmine Otten for the kind invitation to be here, our major speaker for a uh, robust um, statement, and my fellow panelists. Coming at this point in the afternoon, I'm happy to say I disagree with all the panelists. <laughs> uh, I teach theological ethics. Many would think that's oxymoronic. I also claim to be a certain form of Christian humanist, which would also be seen as oxymoronic for many people. What I want to do is say a word about history, some conceptual issues, and then note a certain paradox that surrounds our topic. At the outset, I should say that I agree with much of what Dothat has said about the universities in the United States and their intellectual task, having forsaken addressing the basic questions of human existence. My major difference with him will be what kind of metaphysics are we talking about? and what kind of morality. Metaphysics in the sense of how things hang together in the most comprehensive sense of the term. Morals and ethics about how we should conduct our life. First, a word about history. It must be admitted, it seems to me, that many of the great universities in the United States, Harvard, Yale, Chicago, Princeton, Emory, Duke, Brandeis, the host of Jesuit universities around the United States, were obviously founded by religious communities, not to mention the hundreds of colleges. Without the religions, our intellectual world would be much smaller, institutionally speaking. It is also the case, remarkably, that the same universities have been the context for the rise and flourishing of the modern critical study of religion preeminently the Divinity School here at the University of Chicago, or we like to think preeminently. <laughs> so the idea that religion and religious discourse sh should not be found in the modern university is a historically problematic claim and would deprive us of many of the intellectual tools and disciplines needed to engage the religions or any human cultural phenomena in all of its complexity and messiness precisely as human phenomena found throughout every history and in every culture, the religions at least. So I take it that historically speaking, our topic is a bit ajar 
And that if we wish to replenish our cultural resources, our cultural capital, as it were, which I take to be one of the forces of our address today, we must continue to engage the religions and even more comprehensively than we have in the past. So if historically speaking, our topic might not be as contentious as it seems at first blush, what is then at issue? This brings us to some conceptual matters. Calling himself a religious conservative, I think Dothet means by metaphysics, a religiously laden worldview with the capacity to authorize a moral order consistent with that worldview. If that is right, then, then two basic issues are at stake for the university as such. First, what should be the content of beliefs about the general features of reality, that is our metaphysical beliefs that might found a moral order, and two, how do we validate or show to be true any set of beliefs, whatever they happen to be? Now, what it's not often noted is that the answer to these two questions must traffic together. Why is that? Because if one holds only a procedural sense of validation without content-laden beliefs, then the university is reduced, as we've heard, to a technocratic and procedural model of truth that avoids the basic questions of human existence. Conversely, if one holds to some thick metaphysical beliefs, like religious beliefs, to answer those questions of validity, the proper worry is that these beliefs authorize without question their own truth. This would be to forsake the task of the university to be a truth-seeking community, where truth is not reducible to authority nor to prejudice against authority. So the question, and one that I think the founders of this university and its first Baptist president addressed, was how to hold these two issues together. That is, how to keep open the search for truth of every conviction without prejudice for or against claims to authority, and yet to provide content and direction for inquiry into the root questions of human life, and therefore provide some moral and civic orientation for character and conduct. If we are to sustain, and I think we should, the Socratic quest to corrupt the youth, that is, to awaken people to the task of exploring the truth of their world and their conviction, then the question becomes, to what end or purpose do we hold these two logically distinct issues, questions of validation, question and content, how do we hold them together? In order to do so, in order to answer that question, I contend that we need ongoing inquiry throughout the university into what is best called, in the terms of my discipline, a metaphysics of morals, with respect to the moral sources of culture around the world that have intersected in the evolving context of the West. As far as I can see, only when we can sustain a moral order keyed to the dignity of human beings as moral agents who must assume responsibility for their lives and their several communities, can we insist then on the demand for respect of others in the quest for truth and provide non-coercive yet rational guidance for the conduct of life? I'm quick to add that this does not mean establishing the universe as a university as a paragon of virtue or some new moral police. It also does not mean that ethics and religion and theology are the queen of the sciences, heaven forbid that. It does mean that we see as a whole the, that the university is and ought to be truth seeking within the terms of its several disciplines and seek to provide guidance for the responsible conduct and enrichment of human and non-human life. For myself, this is what the motto of the University of Chicago means, Crescat Scientia Vita Excalator. That ideal should remain in different ways the task of every division 
every school, every department and center at this university. It is how we can replenish critically and deploy available moral resources. Yet at precisely this point, we reach a paradox about the use of ideas about metaphysical and religious background beliefs in order to sustain modern liberal democratic social order. The paradox is, and one not often enough mentioned or noticed, the paradox is, is that such beliefs, as I've suggest, suggested, can be important sources for sustaining human dignity, respect for others, the task of forming truth-seeking communities, but they can rarely, if ever, only, only be used for political ends. Transforming such beliefs into means to some other ends is counterproductive since such beliefs are themselves about the ends and purposes of human existence. They resist being used for their sheer political utility. And when that is attempted, they are denigrated and lose their cognitive and moral power. What this means, I judge, is that the university has the task of isolating within cultural and religious traditions their most humane and truth-seeking dynamics and then extending those insights into the future. In this way, the traditions give rise to thought in order to further more modern purposes without reducing those traditions to their political utility or accepting them whole cloth. This is why the critical and constructive study of religion is necessary for the ongoing vitality of the modern university, especially here at Chicago. Examples of this reductive error is Christian fundamentalism in the United States, no less than Hindu or Islamic or any other religious fundamentalism. All of these have lost and endangered their most humane religious and metaphysical insights by overly politicizing their discourse. The university must render productive the paradox of the use of cultural traditions and their religious and moral sources so that they are known in full and yet do not usurp our struggle to articulate ideals for the future of the liberal social order. If universities do not remain free and open spaces for debate about and proposals for the right and good conduct of human life, it's really not at all clear to me that our doors should not be closed and locked. For then we will have become academic mechanics or ideological uh, proponents. Crescat Scientia will have been severed from Vita Excalator. Thank you very much. Well, let me echo thanks to all the organizers uh, of the conference and to the panelists uh, as well. I, like Ross Douthat, am a Catholic uh, a different kind of Catholic, I suppose. I am not a conservative Catholic. I'm a fan of Pope Francis, a figure about whom uh, Mr. Douthat has been sharply critical. Um, Francis, in a footnote in a papal document, suggested the possibility of pastoral flexibility with regard to the ban on divorced and remarried Catholics receiving communion. Uh, Ross seems to be one of those who regard this as tantamount to the Pope cavorting naked around the Maypole with a bunch of druids. Uh, but Works. I, I, <laughs> Such differences between Catholics illustrate that faith traditions are not monolithic. A tradition is, as philosopher Alistair McIntyre says, an ongoing argument about the goods essential to that tradition. And so if Ross and I were to argue, I'm just going to call you Ross, by the way. I, I've, I've heard your last name pronounced at least three different ways so far. And so I'm just going, to go, just going to go with Ross. So were we to argue over the Pope's footnote, we would not start from scratch or simply state our personal preferences, but we would argue on the basis of mutually accepted premises and texts, lived experience, logical reasoning. 
And McIntyre argues, and I think he's right, that all reasoning is traditioned in this way. Even the Enlightenment is a tradition based on certain core beliefs about the human person, and the fact that the Enlightenment is a tradition that denies it's a tradition has put us in the situation that Ross has so well described. Uh, secularizing projects commonly assume the essential reality of distinctions that we've inherited from the Enlightenment. Religious secular values facts, faith reason, subjective, objective, and so on. And so we've attempted to jettison religion from higher education in order to attain to a more objective and fact-based fact -based pursuit of the truth. The problem, though, as even Max Weber acknowledged, is that supposedly value-free facts tell us nothing about meaning. According to Weber, science fails to answer, quote, the only question important for us. What shall we do and how shall we live? End quote. The absolute divorce between fact and value means there is no factual basis for adjudicating the rival claims of spheres of value. So we make a sheer groundless choice among what Weber calls gods. Quote, many old gods ascend from their graves. They are disenchanted and hence take the form of impersonal forces. End quote. Doesn't sound like Weber, does it? Appeal to a transcendent ground for choice has been cut off. So the purely imminent rationalization that characterizes the modern world necessitates the purely irrational choice of one or more of the gods that, conti that continue to haunt modernity. And so Weber writes, quote, we live as did the ancients when their world was not yet disenchanted of its gods and demons, end quote. So even us in the so-called disenchanted world still live like this, but we don't acknowledge it. And I think that's uh, part of what Ross is getting, up, getting at. And so, um, so we end up, as he said, we try at universities to disguise questions of sexual morality as if they were purely technocratic questions of health we take on the messianic task of social justice, and what, what university today does not advertise that it wants its graduates to go out and change the world, right? But universities try to disguise any commitments upon which we might decide what really is social justice and what is not, or what change in the world is a good change and what is not. On the basis of my Christian commitments, I tend to think that the world has had enough of well-meaning Americans trying to change it. <laughs> but this missionary impulse of 19th century Western Christianity has been secularized into this dangerously underdetermined desire to change the world. And this is not so much a vacuum, in Ross's words, as what historian John Bossie calls a migration of the holy in modernity from the church to locations like the state and the market and the knowledge industry. And I think anyone who has spent time in the modern academy can see that universities do not actually function in practice according to the dichotomy of beliefs and facts. There are all sorts of dogmas that are not restricted to divinity schools. Uh, you could ask, for example, how many Marxists are there in the economics department or the business school here at the University of Chicago? The answer, I think, is probably not many. I would wager that there's far more dissent in the divinity school uh, and I think of like Christian Smith's book, he's a sociologist uh, who writes and basically s argues that uh, sociology is kind of covert theology. The dogmas of one discipline furthermore might conflict with the dogmas of another with little explicit shared conception of truth on which to adjudicate such claims. Gerald Graff tells the following anecdote. Quote, an undergraduate tells of an art history course in which the instructor observed one day as we now know, the idea that knowledge can be objective is a positivist myth that has been exploded by postmodern thought. It so happens that the student is concurrently enrolled in a political science course in which the instructor speaks confidently about the objectivity of his discipline as if objectivity has not been exploded at all. <laughs> what do you do, the student is asked. What else can I do, he says. I trash objectivity in art history and I presuppose objectivity <laughs> in political science. <laughs> So universities also do not function according to the idea of academic freedom as absence of all limitations on speech. There are limits. It's increasingly obvious that there is no one-size-fits-all concept of academic freedom, nor has there ever been. Historically, 
the German Lehrfreiheit that developed in the 19th century was very different from the freedom that American professors were given. German professors could teach on any subject that interested them and were not expected to present all sides of any issue, but were expected to try to win students over to their point of view. As one of my professors said on the first day of class uh, at Duke, um, I don't want you to think for yourselves, I want you to think like me. Right. <laughs> Today, invitations to controversial speakers pit the freedom to say anything one wants against the freedom to learn in an unthreatening environment. At DePaul last year, one of these right-wing, foul-mouthed shock jocks was invited, but the event was shut down when protesters stormed the stage, sending hundreds of angry white men storming across the campus, shouting epithets at the Muslim campus ministry who were just trying to have a picnic out on the quad. <laughs> Appeals to a contentless freedom can't solve this dilemma. Someone must make some judgments about what is not allowable speech. There's a difference between responsible conservative opinion and profane provocateurs getting their 15 minutes of fame. A week after Milo came and went, Rick Santorum spoke on campus without incident. Milo should not have been allowed, but to make such judgments, one needs a substantive account of freedom, one embedded in an institution's normative commitments. And these commitments need not be Christian, but at a nominally Catholic university like mine, there's at least a sense that one can appeal to certain shared commitments in order to make such judgments. Reasoning is part of a tradition of inquiry founded on sh certain shared beliefs in the absence of which the university is reduced to, as Clark Kerr, former University of California president said, a series of individual faculty entrepreneurs united by grievances over parking. <laughs> So even though if one accepts that normative convictions are needed and are covertly already present in universities, some object that religious convictions in particular are antithetical to a free university. But here I want to appeal to a whole wave of scholarship over the last few decades that has shown that the religious secular distinction is a contingent invention of the modern West and not simply part of the natural furniture of the world. There was so, no such distinction in the pre-modern West and no such distinction in non-Western countries before they were colonized. There's a long and complex genealogy here being told by scholars across multiple disciplines, but the upshot is that there is no essential difference between beliefs in God or gods on the one hand and beliefs in nations, freedom, the invisible hand of the market, the genius of the emperor, the will of the people, or commodity fetishism on the other. A uh, survey of religious studies literature finds the following treated under the rubric religion. Totems, witchcraft, human rights, Marxism, liberalism, Freudianism, Japanese tea ceremonies, nationalism, sports fanaticism, free market ideology, Alcoholics Anonymous, and the list goes on. The implication of this scholarship is decidedly not that all worldviews or normative convictions are equally valid. So leveling the playing field doesn't mean that the game is uh, going to end in a tie. It does mean, however, that there is no prima facie reason to exclude so-called religious discourse from the type of inquiry that goes on at universities. So as I often say to my students, don't tell me that you have facts, but I have beliefs, right? We both have both. So you tell me what you believe, I'll tell you what I believe, and then let's have a conversation. So Ross is right that there's no turning back the clock to confessional universities, and of course even confessional universities are not confessional in the way they were in the 1950s. With a few exceptions, Catholic universities, for example, are places where Catholic discourse is just one discourse among many, uh, fading at many of them. But by not excluding so-called religious questions, such universities signal to students that there may be meaning in life that is encountered and not simply chosen. Truth that is encountered and not simply chosen. Most students today don't need liberation from narrow religious dogmatism, but they rather need liberation from the dogmatism of the self, the notion that meaning, like any other commodity, is decided by mere preference. Thank you. Is that okay? Yeah. okay? So do you care to respond? 
Um, well, I mean, apart from our disagreements about the Holy Father, I find absolutely, you know, there's almost perfect common ground between us. So we've, we've, we've healed Roman Catholicism in one, in one discussion. Right, glad you took care of it. Um, yeah, no, this is, this is, yeah, you, you can be the Jewish observer right. of, this, yeah, observer. of this. What a moment. It's, it's a big, it's a big moment for all of us. Um, no, let me, let me try and, since I'm generally in agreement with many of the points that, that both of you have made. I'm, I'm trying to think of something sort of provocative to say about them. This is the <laughs> perpetual burden of the newspaper columnist. Right. Sort of how can you take general agreement and destroy it in order to have, in order to have an argument and get a thousand comments on your piece. Um, but I, I was thinking about um, your distinction between the sort of metaphysical and moral issues. Because I mean, one of the interesting things within religious conservatism as a kind of tradition, right, in its own right, mm -hmm. that sort of developed in American life in certain ways in response to the 1960s, and that sort of reflects a unique and distinctive and probably temporary alliance of groups that used to be in conflict, evangelicals, Catholics, Orthodox Jews, Mormons, um, and, and so on. P part of the, the implicit theory of religious conservatism was that you could do a kind of version of the move that you partially critique, that you could sort of, you could sort of do morals without metaphysics, basically, mm -hmm. or that you yeah. could do, that you could assume mm -hmm. a thin metaphysic, you know, that unites Western monotheists, and you know, if you want to follow C.S. Lewis's argument in the abolition of man, you could say, oh, well, there's actually this, this sort of general. Dow that that unites not only Western monotheism but every, you know all, all these religious traditions. You can assume that, and then you can get to what you know the the Catholics within religious conservatism would call natural law disputes. Usually, and you know you can say, well, we're assuming this thin metaphysic, and then within that metaphysic, we're assuming that we can reason about morality and come to sort of common conclusions. And the thesis of some of the people I grew up reading who were religious conservatives was that you know, this, this was a way to supply, um, I guess to go back to my, the tentative end of my remarks, the kind of, a kind of religious center for American culture, that what was mm -hmm. lost in the social crisis of the 60s and the crack up of the Protestant mainline could be regained by different conservative religious groups reasoning together based on these thin metaphysical pre premises and this sort of alliance could you know f could sort of replace the main line there was this was sort of i think a real a real f belief that conservative catholics and evangelicals had especially in the 1990s and it sort of peaked with the presidency of George W Bush and transcribed the downward <laughs> the downward arc with that presidency as well um, and uh, you know what, this this project failed and it's I think I think it pretty clearly failed and you know one of one of the reasons that it failed I think is Im implicit in your analysis which is that you know you the metaphysics and morals are always in dialogue with each other mm -hmm. and you can't you know you, you you can't sort of assume well basically the way you think metaphysically then reflects the kind of natural law moral vision that you end up with. And you know, part of what had happened in American culture since the 60s was that this sort of thin, the nature of the, nature of the metaphysical center had shifted. And it had shifted in this more individualistic direction. It had shifted in this more Oprah Winfrey-ish mm -hmm. direction. Mm -hmm. And that shift meant that the kind, of, the kind of move that evangelicals and Catholics, conservative ones, wanted to do they were assuming a different metaphysic than the one that more and more Americans had. And so when they went to, you know, they sort of assumed this metaphysic and, and went to moral reasoning and reached conclusions, and the great many Americans looked at those conclusions and said, well, I don't, you know, I don't agree with that at all. How did you, know, how did you argue that same-sex marriage is wrong again? What's, what's the move you were making there? That, you know, that doesn't make sense, and so on. And this, in turn, descends into deeper questions about natural law theology that I'm not really competent to, to completely adjudicate. But I think it's sort of a case study in, in how you, you sort of, you know, you can't, 
essentially any kind of serious religious argument, inquiry, debate, and so on, has to be working in both arenas simultaneously mm -hmm. and sort of working back yeah. and forth mm -hmm. between, mm -hmm. between the two. Um, but this is then, I think, can, can also be usefully applied to um, the sort of the problems with the liberal enlightenment tradition that denies it's a tradition, right? Which is that it really, really increasingly wants to keep metaphysics somewhere up here and mm -hmm. just, and say, we, we're just assuming this and, you know, assume that all men are created equal, even though we're, we're not, creator, is there a creator? We're not gonna get into that. We're just assuming right. this, this, the thinnest possible principle and then we're going to reason together from there. And I think what you've seen in Western political and cultural life, especially in the last 10 years, is just sort of how that, how that can break down, basically. Because you have all of these, you have this increasing plurality of groups in Western society, ranging from uh, you know, Muslim immigrants to Western Europe to religious traditionalists in the United States to all the varying kinds of secularized Americans from, you know, secularized Americans mm -hmm. who are secularized in an elite academic kind of way to secularized Americans who are secularized in a, I've drifted away from church and split up with my girlfriend and I watch it play a lot of video games kind of way. Like those are two completely different forms of secularization. So you have all of these disparate groups and the liberal center can't, it, it doesn't want to reach up. It doesn't want to reach up because it's understandably, for reasons that <laughs> you identify having to do with, you know, the, what happens when we start fighting about metaphysics, it doesn't want to reach up there. But in the absence of, of that kind of reach, its authority weakens and weakens and weakens. And I think that's a big part of the story of the European elite that mm -hmm. is now under pressure from all kinds of different groups from sort of a, an effective kind of Catholic traditionalism resurgent in Poland and Eastern Europe mm -hmm. to unassimilated Muslim communities that, you know, it's are, that just have a totally different metaphysic. And you can't get to this kind of, well, let's reason together and get to sort of, you know, the principles that govern, you know, mm -hmm. life in the mm -hmm. low countries, mm -hmm. for instance. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> And so, you know, the, the center, the sort of the elite of Europe doesn't know how to handle this. And, mm -hmm. the, and again, I'm not, you know, I'm, I, I don't have clear conclusions or paths forward to offer because I think, you know, they're all, they, they all carry with them problems. But I think what actually is likely to happen in historical terms is that this, this kind of attenuation of, you know, morals and metaphysics is just going to, you know, it's just going to lead to real breakdown and conflict of the kind that liberalism originally came into being mm -hmm. to try and manage and resist. Um, and I don't think we're headed for that immediately. I think sort of some of our dislocations right now are sort of, you know, the mini storm before a storm that's probably some generations off. But I, I think mm -hmm. we're eventually headed for a kind of crack up of liberalism that will require if liberalism is to sort of go through it successfully, some sort of re-engagement with the metaphysical and not just with the, the moral and political. Mm -hmm. yeah, let, let, can I just ask a question? Sure. Uh, that will allow you to respond. So uh, I think the last two responses had something in common in, in talking about religion and, and politics. And I wanted to follow up from that. So Professor Schweiker was saying, you know, religion should not just be commodified into politics, right? It should not be politicized for fear of leave, uh, leave, um, losing the authenticity of, of religious positions. What the, the kind of quib of Professor Kavanaugh and, and, and uh, about the Pope laid bare is that you can, of course, devolve into church politics or religious sure. politics. Sure. And, and my question is actually, do we think, and this connects it back to free speech, do we think that in order to have interreligious debate, which is then bound to come up at a modern university, do we need to have a pre-existing ethos, say, of free speech to, to govern, regulate that? Or can religion sort of instill us with these values, that kind of an ethos? Can I just Good. respond yeah. real quickly? Um, if I've understood what you say, you agree with me completely. 
Absolutely. In the, fo in the following <laughs> the, respect. The point the that she raised, actually, there's probably more disagreement, but we can. Okay. Yeah. The, the, the issue is not thick or thin. The issue is if you use the term metaphysics, you're talking about the most general features of reality. I don't think the main major features of reality are political liberalism or conservatism. Right. I don't think we can go out and find that in black holes, and I don't think we're going to find it in solar systems, and I don't think we're... So the question is whether or not we can make arguments for the human respect and dignity and concern as a constitutive feature of reality, or if we're going to go the route of most modern universities and say that the universe is simply morally neutral. Mm -hmm. well, so when I emphasize the ways. notion mm -hmm. of okay. metaphysics of mm -hmm. morals, right. mm -hmm. I'm trying to argue against a different problem than worrying about whether one's a liberal or a conservative. Mm -hmm. It has to do with the status of and the truth claims of what we believe and think we can defend rationally about the dignity and respect owed human beings. And as far as I can tell, that's exactly what you're arguing out of a specific tradition. Right. I mean, I, I mm -hmm. think the issue in part in the modern university is, is that there is a desire to have liberal commitments that are drawn as conclusions from metaphysical premises while asserting a set of metaphysical premises that don't lead to liberal conclusions. That, that, that mm -hmm, sort of mm -hmm. the strict neo-Darwinian, atheist, materialist, metaphysical premises, you can, you can sit there with them all day and you will never get to Thomas Jefferson. Yeah, amen. Um, that's why I'm that's, saying you have that's to have a right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, moral. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, so we, mm -hmm. we, we agree. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hope. But you had an issue with what I was saying. <laughs> well, I was going to say I'm a little mm -hmm. more, I'm hesitant mm -hmm. about, I mean, you know, the, when the religious is subsumed by the political, whether in the form of the extremes yeah. of fundamentalism mm -hmm. or, you know, the extremes of certain forms of, you know, I mean, certain forms of Marxism are a kind of subsumation, too, I think. You can, it's there on the right and the left. That is disastrous. But I'm generally a defender of sort of theological politics as a necessary corollary of sincere religious belief. So there's a, there's, you know, there's a tension there, obviously, where there's a temptation that you fall into and so on. But you can't, and again, this is where I, you know, I respect the, I respect the passion of the <laughs> campus activists who I disagree with because I think they are correct that, mm -hmm. you know, if you have, I think they have, you know, a weak metaphysics and a strong morals, but how, you know, where, mm -hmm. however you, you, you strike the balance, that kind of commitment does imply, it does imply political things in the real world. It implies that the yeah. theo you know, a theopolitical, and that's why your, again, your skepticism about religion in that <laughs> sense, it's true that in any religion taken seriously will ultimately want a certain degree of political mastery mm -hmm. because it yeah. will want to make the world in a particular, take over in a particular yeah. image. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think it will take yeah. over the political. That's what I was trying to get at. Well, because that, they are ultimate systems of belief. Except, yeah. that, except that when you ever get down to the real concrete problems. Mm -hmm. So we can say lovely things, Bill, about like, we should all respect human dignity and human life. And then here comes our Catholic theologian saying, human life begins here, right? Mm -hmm. And our Jewish theologians yeah. and Muslim theologians say, no, 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 here. So what mm -hmm. do we do about that kind of conflict? Yeah. So it appeals that. to a normative mm -hmm. universalist reality, mm -hmm. a metaphysics. It doesn't really work as an ethicist because you have to make a decision mm -hmm. and you're going to have to cope That's with true. disagreement. Yeah. Yeah. And the only way we can do that, is my point, is allow religious, thick religious arguments to be presented mm -hmm. in the public square. Yeah. And then if they're the right arguments, mm -hmm. they may win. They may win the day. I'll give you a concrete example in bioethics terms, which is stem cell research, right? The Catholic theologian said, this is a kind of murder and you can't create yeah. embryos to, for destruction. That argument, even though I disagreed with it, changed the tenor of the discourse. And people slowed what they were doing and then began to look at other methodologies, 
iPS cells instead of it because everyone came to understand that you couldn't do something that was so offensive to your neighbor. Mm -hmm. And it was a good argument. And, we, and, and that's the way that, in fact, these arguments are both religious and have us take a stand politically. But ultimately, we want you to think that we're right. Well, you not could try. Just, I mean, not you could just, try, no, right. Right. but not I could argue just, back, and it's like, yeah. right. you may not be, and I may not think that you're mm -hmm. right, but I think you have the right to make the argument, and it did shift the debate in very mm -hmm. real terms. I'm a very practical ethicist, so that really had an impact on me. But I could disagree with the foundational idea, but agree that there was something there that we had to capture, and we had to change our policy. And what persuades is not the claim of, of my religion says this. Right. What persuades is making the argument about why we should have this moral yeah. view, right? right. Yeah. right? Yeah. Not because my religion says it, right. yeah. but because, because it's there's a good some argument. moral argument right. underlying it. Yeah. Let's talk about it. Mm -hmm. Let's figure out if we can find common ground. Right. Yeah. But the presupposition I don't for those arguments require respect for persons. Yeah. Otherwise, you wouldn't listen to the persons, argument. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's how you define person. Mm -hmm. yeah. And which persons are you concerned with? Yeah. Sure. I mean, part of the question here is um, uh, uh, the distinction between universal and particular and the kind of illusory, I think, search for a kind of universal overarching um, agreement that, that we're all going to be able to kind of uh, put our, uh, like a universal political agreement that we're all going to be able to put our religious mm -hmm. uh, agreements uh, aside. I mean, there, natural law, I think, has been uh, a really dangerous thing precisely for the reasons that Ross said. I mean. Catholics think natural law is universal, and everybody else thinks natural law is Catholic, yeah. right? And and that's um, sort that's of part like, of the sort problem, of like the church right? Itself, you know. And so, um, <laughs> right. Um, so the idea that that we need to come up with rules for discussion before we start talking, I think, is a dangerous uh, idea. That we we just talk and um, and then we see what what happens in the kind of give and take. Uh, of uh, of conversation, um, where I would maybe want to push back on Ross or see what you have to to say about this. I, I've just been reading your book, uh, Bad Religion, okay. and um, you, you you kind of make certain arguments, uh, historical arguments, in there about what has happened to Christianity in in America, and the underlying assumption seems to be that the ultimate goal is America in some ways, right? And, and there, that's something that's been underlying this discussion as well, is how do we serve, how do, how do universities serve America? Right. And, and that yeah. might be a problem, right? I mean, it, because precisely what happens to Catholicism in America might, I mean, the, the kind of emptying out and secularization that happens might in some ways be the result of, a, of assimilation, yes. right? And, mm -hmm. and loss uh, of particularity. Yeah. And so the idea that our ultimate goal is to kind of buttress the American social order, um, I, I think you might want to uh, nuance that or, or, or walk that back in significant ways. I mean, the, ultimately, you know, you, you want to argue that the ultimate goal is truth. Yes. I mean, I, I think that there, there is a sense in which you, if the truth is true, you would expect it to have some positive social consequences. Um, not always and everywhere, not necessarily, mm -hmm. but I don't think it's unreasonable to say, uh, you know, religion X is truth claims can be analyzed in part in terms of whether the society, a society dominated by said religion seems to enhance human flourishing. Um, and that's, right. that's my mm -hmm. partial defense mm -hmm. of that mm -hmm. tack that I took in the book. But my, my, no, my general view, I, I think that corrective is correct. And it's sort of, you know, my, my view is that the American social order is worth propping up until it isn't. That's yeah. the, that, that, you know, we live in America. Mm -hmm. It is our, it's our country. It is yeah. our culture, a word that mm -hmm. has cult at its root. Mm -hmm. And you want that, that, country to have a religious center and a religious common ground that reflects insofar as possible in a pluralist and pluralistic diverse society truth real truths about human mm -hmm. existence and at certain points in our history I think we've come closer to that and at certain points we've strayed and the optimistic reading of the argument I made in that book is that there's again a kind of wave function where you mm -hmm. have sort of convergence and then between different religious traditions on a sort of plausible common ground and then you have a crisis and so on and then and things break apart but then there can be reconvergence. I go back and forth about whether I think mm -hmm. that kind of reconvergence is possible now and whether I think in the long run the 
often happy relationship that Catholicism has had to the American experiment can persist. And this is sort of, for those of you mm -hmm. who are unfortunate enough to follow young Catholic uh, intellectual debate online, which maybe is five or six of you, that's sort of <laughs> where the lively debate is right mm -hmm. now, that you, you know, mm -hmm. sort of where Catholics younger than myself seem to be sort of dividing into a kind of Marxist inflected left Catholicism and that's much more radical than liberal mm -hmm. Catholicism or a kind of much more traditionalist, even integralist right Catholicism that's more reactionary, though they would deny the use of that term. They'd say it's very forward looking. Um, <laughs> but, but either way, that's, that's sort of where my sense of, for, for Catholics in their 20s who are thinking about these issues, who've come of age in a different world than I did in the America of you know, a Trumpified Republican Party and a secularized liberalism, there's a lot of argument about, you know, is the American experiment worth saving or is it headed in, in a direction that's incompatible with, with Catholicism? So I'm, I'm on the fence. I'm open to persuasion in different directions, but I completely agree that you only prop it up, you, you know, you only want the center to hold as long as the center approximates something you think is true. Yeah. And when the center moves enough, as mm -hmm. it certainly has moved, I think, in the last 50 or 60 years, I mean, the value of the center, you know, something like the civil rights movement could only succeed, I think, in part because it could successfully appeal to a Christian center in American life. In the, or, you know, we mm -hmm. called it a Judeo-Christian okay. center, but I it know. really was yeah. at that point yeah. still... You know, and, 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 it, and the civil rights movement, I don't think it was a coincidence that it succeeded at a moment when the mainline sort of Billy Graham style evangelicalism and Roman Catholicism had converged relative mm -hmm. to where they were in the 1920s and 1930s. So there was this kind of sort of post-war, you know, Jacques Maritain inflected kind mm -hmm. of consensus about, you know, religion is good and human rights are good and these things work together and so on. And King himself drew on that. Yeah. You know, he made arguments that were mm -hmm. kind of premised on, you know, letter from Birmingham jail is is filled with sort of appeals mm -hmm. to different to a kind of ecumenical Christian common ground. And you know, I, I think that was a good thing. It was good that we had that, even though it wasn't the fullness of Catholic truth, <laughs> whatever that may be, uh, in the Pope Francis era. It was good that we had that common ground, but if- you Had to get that old dig at Pope Francis. Yeah, what are you, the Druids, the nudity man, Druids. come on. Let me, let, me, let me, you know, I mean, what's, Druids are great. Uh, Stonehenge, man. Anyway, um, but yes, I, but to, I'm being long-winded, so, but, so I, I agree that there, you know, yeah, there are moments when societies cease to be places in which Catholicism or any other religious yeah. condition can fully feel at home. And of course, the Jewish tradition has spent its almost the entirety yeah. of its history <laughs> dealing with that yeah. dilemma. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And just to say, I mean, like, it wasn't only a Christian moment, the civil rights movement. It was for, for Jewish intellectuals. Yeah. And it, was, it was, you know, Abraham Joshua Heschel marching in the front. Yeah. Um, much that history is lost. And it was a trade union movement, too. It was an interesting and important moment in American history where we decided this was right and this was necessary, and we joined together in that. And it was across religious lines using scriptural language, yeah. which I think that's, that's still, uh, that still is a basis yeah. for... But, but you've got the same sort of debates going on within the Jewish community. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm thinking of Cudahy's book and the ordeal of civility, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, part yeah. of the, you, you buy into the bargain of liberal uh, democracy and then the synagogue empties out in, in right. some ways. Except right? that what's happening in Judaism is fundamentally interesting and different, I think. I mean, when I read your book, I thought, this is a different story that I'm partaking in, where there's enormous growth of orthodoxy, both modern orthodoxy and Haredi. Yeah. Orthodoxy, and so it's a very interesting moment. And then the complexities of Israel and Zionism, and how that's experienced, yeah. are also part of that story. Um, and yes, there is, a, you know, there's a there's a problem with the, with the center, and with a, a Judaism based on Americanism in some sense. But it's an ongoing debate that I'm for joining in happily with those 20 year olds about whether um, it is possible to live a fully Jewish life in in diaspora <laughs> or not. That's a very lively debate. Right. And can I ask, what do you make of the gay rights movement? <laughs> in, Just in, 30, chair, in 30 seconds or less. Yeah. yeah. Um, in religion, I mean, what in... From in, the same perspective yes. you talked about the civil rights movement. Yeah. Mm. I think the, the gay rights movement is a moment when the, I guess that sort of 
the presuppositions that I'm talking about shifted in a more, well, I mean, it, sorry, it's, <laughs> it's easier. The, I mean, the sexual revolution. That's why I like being a professor. The, right. The, yes. I mean, the sexual revolution. <laughs> what do you think? The <laughs> sexual revolution generally <laughs> seems to me to have sort of created a decisive break between New Testament sexual morality um, and sort of modern bourgeois life in a way that what, that's, I mean, the, a big part of this, the disappearance of the possibility of this kind of center is that the center of America accepts the sexual revolution. And it's very hard, I'm not going to say impossible, but it's very hard to balance any kind of sort of traditional religious orthodoxy and a full acceptance of the sexual revolution. For a period of time, gay rights seemed like the sort of the exception, right? It was this place where the traditionalists said, well, we still, this, mm -hmm. the center is still with us. Um, but in fact, it, it, I think it ultimately, um, I probably said this in bad religion, so you probably you know, <laughs> repeat yourself. But the, you know, it, it turned out to be, to, to be a weak point once, once the sort of logic had fully unfolded and sort of social change had advanced far enough that you know, people actually knew that they had gay relatives and gay friends and neighbors and so on. So it's, it's sort of, it's actually one of the hardest points of traditional sexual ethics. And therefore, it's the place where sort of, the, in the end, the tension between that ethic and the emergent, more sort of individualistic ethic has become sharpest. Um, is that does that does that make sense? Yeah, that sort of yeah. it's easy. I mean, we're talking about the divorce mm -hmm, debate mm -hmm. in the Catholic Church. The yeah. you know, Catholic, what Catholicism says to divorced and remarried people, it's it's a hard teaching, right? But at least they're told that they can marry one person, right? And um, and the person who's attracted to members of the same sex is told something much harder. And again, as you come to yeah to to know actual gay people, that tension becomes apparent and it becomes a stronger place of breakdown and tension, I think, than, than even intellectually at least, and than the, than the divorce revolution before it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But isn't there a way in which you can read the New Testament and extend it to gay marriage? I mean, I, I don't find that so problematic. I mean, Paul is a little hard, but, but the gospel is a little. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, right. So first you have to exclude Paul or, yeah. or you can, you know, I mean, yeah, we, you can re, you reread Paul and you say he's just talking about promiscuous homosexuality sure. yes. and, mm -hmm. and, and so on. Um, but then you're still left with, uh, you know, the, I mean, the, the, I mean, what, what Jesus does in the New Testament is take the Jewish law around sex and marriage and make it more demanding mm -hmm. and focus it more intently, I th in, at least in his explicit words, on male-female difference and sort of the idea of sort of the, you know, the rejoining of male and female as sort of the, the fundament, if you will, of mm -hmm. um, sort of sexual relational life. So I, I guess my, my, general, my general reaction to the rereadings is, um, and this may seem like a strange way of putting it, but I, I feel like if the rereadings are correct, then there is a kind of deep unfairness and even trickery in God's revelation. Because, you know, I mean, Jesus overturns a lot of customs and taboos. Right. He, mm -hmm. comes in, he comes in and, you know, knocks everything over. And only on, se on sex, and, uh, sex and money, he doesn't. Sex mm -hmm. and money, he makes mm -hmm. tougher. R ritual stuff, he makes easier. Gender difference, mm -hmm. he makes easier. He's you know, mm -hmm. very, you know, very gender egalitarian relative to, to the landscape of the time. There's sort of implicit, I think, strong implicit racial egalitarianism in the New Testament. Um, but there, the, that sort of, you know, the traditional Jewish sort of view of what sex is and what it's for and who should do it is, is strengthened. And so it's not that the reading is impossible, but <laughs> it implies something to me about Jesus as God and the trustworthiness of revelation that is, would make me skeptical about the nature of the God I'm being asked to worship. That, you know, but, but, surely Jesus could have, 
dropped a hint <laughs> and said, you know, I mean, there were gay people yeah. in in first sentence. Yeah. You know, there were divorced people. I mean, he he could have he if he if he and God the Father know, yeah. you know, have divine foreknowledge and so on. They certainly he was certainly capable of overturning traditions and taboos. Why did he ask same-sex attracted Christians to bear their cross to no purpose for two thousand mm -hmm. years? It seems awfully harsh of a God of love not to, not to make, th make his agreement with contemporary sexual liberalism a little more explicit. But as, as, a, <laughs> but, but one comment, as, as a Protestant, what I like about the Catholic tradition is that it's so rich that it's not limited to just scripture. So Augustine, on the good of marriage, sees the essence of marriage friendship, friendship. Mm -hmm. before offspring, sacrament, and fidelity. So I think there, there's enough in the Catholic tradition that you can actually make the case. And, and I feel that certainly at a university, it behooves theologians to make that case, to try and bring certainly. sources in the I'm, I'm just saying I find it a little, I, I'm, not, I'm not convinced by it. I'm not, I'm yeah. not saying that you mm -hmm. shouldn't make the case. It's more just, and, and this is a case where my own Catholicism has probably, you know, I'm, I was a teenager, so I'm this neither a cradle Catholic nor an adult convert. But I came out of I came to Catholicism out of various forms of Protestantism as a kid, and one of the arguments that you know I bought into was that in a certain way, Catholicism has maintained, you know, Catholicism is always accused of sort of by Protestants of developing, mm -hmm. developing the 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 perfect truth of the gospel with all the you know you got Mary over here and the Pope over there and purgatory <laughs> over there and so on, but. On this sort of, you know, as I read the New Testament, there is a, there is an asceticism to Jesus' message that I certainly don't live out in my own life, but that the <laughs> church has successfully maintained in its view of not both marriage and its, you know, its emphasis on celibacy and its emphasis on poverty. You know, I mean, the, the church has failed to live out the sort of communal model of the first disciples, but it has maintained in that you know, in the monastic tradition, this sort of intensity. So I, again, I find that sort of, that link between Catholicism and the, and the Gospels, the link between these sort of hard parts of Catholicism and the Gospels to be one of the more compelling reasons to be Catholic, which again explains some of my, no doubt, over the top skepticism <laughs> about Pope Francis. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Rather than a question about the nature of the deity or the nature of revelation or Christology, I think the deeper question here with respect to Jeff's question is, is there progress in moral knowledge? Yeah. Right. Yeah. If one yeah. starts with a yeah. certain conception of mm -hmm. tradition and metaphysics, there mm -hmm. cannot be. Mm -hmm. Your own admission that when you get to know gay people, you might yeah. change would yep. suggest prima facie that there is growth in moral knowledge. And the mm -hmm. question then becomes mm -hmm. is whether or not the university should be dedicated to the act of yeah. trying to grow yes. moral knowledge. Mm -hmm. yeah. Which yeah. is tricky. Yes. Right? Because then you're doing it without a metaphysics and like what does that yeah. mean? And then what are the limits? Yeah. So let's just be frank. The theological tradition suggests real limits on desire. All sorts of desire. From what you eat to who you sleep with to how you treat your neighbor and what you do with a poor person. And there's real ways to do it. It's really, it's not just in my tradition, it's strongly suggested by Jesus in the New, in the New Testament. There's a certain way to be, and it's hard. And it didn't fit in with, with the Roman world. It just didn't fit in. It, that's, right? I mean, that should be obvious to any Christian. Right? It just didn't fit in. There were theological claims that ran him into absolute um, coll you know, collision, deadly collision with with the Roman authorities. Of course, that's the case here. So we have to, I, I want to hold two things in tension, Bill. I want to say, it is interesting to me to, to explore with Catholic theologians um, and traditionalist Protestants where their theology takes them. And I understand sometimes it, it's not going to be a dead on match with liberal theory. And so sure. this Fair is. Fair enough. Yeah, yeah, and, and, the liberal theory, and the liberal theory may be right, it may be wrong. We, we have to figure out what the limits are. It seems to us in, in an. Um, in a sensorial way, in a friendship way, 
to make one, it makes sense to us. But you know, we don't know where, you know where this goes and how far it goes and where the limits are. And we have to sort of think that all through. Yes. And when mm -hmm. you, you want the university, we want the university to allow a big fight, to allow an argument, mm -hmm. so you can have all the, the right. different ideas fairly presented without silencing them. That seems to me what the university should do, rather than say, we're going to choose this path and claim it as our path. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. sure. But if we ask the same question with respect to race, right? Yeah. And that's, would, that's I the, hope yeah. we'd all agree right, right. that there's been more yeah. <coughs> halting and by far a long ways mm -hmm. to go. And part of that comes through right. a dedication to mm -hmm. growth and moral yeah. knowledge mm -hmm. yes. through seeking a truth seeking community. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and sexual ethics is very complicated. Yes. Yeah. You know, yeah. gay marriage is one pole, other pole is is the thing you critique in the Oprah desire. You know, so there's, it's a very complicated and interesting argument to which we bring the full power of our sense of not only what God might be, but who we are. Yeah. And it's also worth emphasizing that progress is real, but not linear. That, sure. mm -hmm. Absolutely. that, that, yes. that Western yep. society over the course of the Enlightenment transcribed an arc of moral regress on race mm -hmm. for sure. Sure. That, yes. the position yes. of, yeah. of Black people in the medieval world, you know, mm -hmm. in, in the few that were in medieval Europe, was very different from the position of black mm -hmm. people in the Jim Crow, in yeah. the Jim Crow yeah. South, yeah. to say nothing. Yeah. And that yeah. the yeah, and that the scientific method and scientific right. in inquiry and modes of knowing were consistently invoked in order to justify sure. racial hierarchy and racial mm -hmm. oppression. Mm -hmm. So the role, the useful role of the strange reactionary at the university mm -hmm. is that kind of reminder, and to say. Are you certain yeah. that you know what's happened with abortion law in the United right. States mm -hmm. represents moral progress? Are you certain yeah. that mm -hmm. stem cell research yeah. represents mm -hmm. right. moral progress yeah. and so yeah. on? Mm -hmm. um, but again, the goal is you know, as the reactionary is still to win, and right. so it's not just <laughs> not just there as a kind of gadfly mm -hmm. to provoke. On that note, looking at the progression of time, uh, <laughs> I actually want to close the discussion, thanking all the panelists, thanking you for being here, thanking all our sponsors, and especially thanking Ross Douthat for his contribution. Thank you all.